Yeah. All right, this is Unit 4, Lesson 2. Today we're going to be measuring public opinion. Um, yesterday we talked about political ideology and how as you grew up, you're getting politically socialized and you're acquiring values and that led to your political ideology or you're either a liberal or a conservative or a fascist or a communist. Um, today we're talking about public opinion and you need to remember what public opinion is. So to give you a definition, public opinion is a distribution of a population's beliefs or attitudes about government and about politics. Again, public opinion is a distribution of a population's beliefs about government and politics. Before you get confused, what we talked about yesterday is political ideology. Liberals, conservatives, it's a set of ideas that belong to you, it belongs to an individual. Public opinion belongs to a population. It belongs to a group of people. Like for example, if I asked you this question today, should abortion be legal in the United States, and I gave you A, B, C, and D, let's say 20% of you chose A, 30% of you chose B, and 50% of you chose D, I just measured the public opinion of this class. Public opinion belongs to a group of people. But do you have any questions on that? An ideology belongs to someone, it belongs to an individual. Public opinion belongs to a group of people. It's a distribution. There is no one public opinion. As you see here, it's a distribution. Anyone have any questions about what public opinion is? Public opinion, who does it belong to? It belongs to a group of people, it belongs to a population. It's a distribution of that population's beliefs. So why do we measure public opinion? Because policy making should be guided by public opinion. We are a democracy, in a perfect democracy, our politicians, our representatives, when they're over there making policy, they look at public opinion, and they use that as a guide when they're making decisions. So, we care about public opinion because policy making is affected by public opinion. Our politicians should be looking at public opinion when they're making decisions and when they're creating policy for you and me. Public opinion can inform policy debates, this is an important thing um, it's going to be in your test. Public opinion informs policy debates in government. Right now, our politicians in government are each other's throats. They're arguing about policy. They're arguing whether or not to say yes or no to on, on bills today. Uh, and one of the ways that they can guide that policy debate is by looking at public opinion. So, if we're Congress and we're arguing about abortion, what would probably be a good idea? Uh, ask the public. Ask the public. Look at what the public believes about abortion and then use that to support your ideology, to support your cause. So if the majority of the people in the United States supports abortion and you're a Democrat and you also support abortion, you can show public opinion and then you can use that as a way um, to um, support your side of the story. All right, answer that uh, bullet for me, please. Branch is relatively immune from public opinion. The judicial branch is relatively immune from public opinion. Congress and the President of the United States, they have to rely a lot on public opinion because they're hoping to get reelected and their job depends on their constituents. But the judicial branch doesn't have to really worry about public opinion. They're free to make decisions, even if those decisions are unpopular ones. But other representatives, like senators, House of Representatives members, and the President of the United States, they do not have that luxury. They have to look at public opinion if they hope to get reelected. All right, public opinion also affects elections. Public opinion affects elections. If you're a candidate, you need to be to look, taking a look at public opinion. You need to know what people think, what people think about you, what people think about your stances on issues. And by knowing that, by knowing what people want and what people think about you, you can guide your campaign and you can save money and you can save time. It doesn't matter how rich you are, you can be Donald Trump and you can have billions of dollars. You have limited resources. Time and money is always limited during campaigns. By looking at public opinion, you can save some time and you can save some money. So I'll give you some example. What public opinion does is it focuses a campaign. So let's say I'm Donald Trump. And I'm trying to figure out, I don't have a lot of time, I don't have a lot of money. So I'm trying to figure out, in the state of Texas, where should I spend my time in? Where should I be dedicating my time? And where should I be dedicating my funds and campaigning to? So according to public opinion, according to the polls, 
most of North Texas and East Texas, they support me. So they like me. But South Texas and Western Texas, they don't like me. So what do I do? Where do I campaign? To like Amarillo. I would go to the southern part of Texas. I would go to why, why wouldn't I campaign here? Oh, it's already already like like because I've already won. Uh, they already like me. So by looking at public opinion, I save some time. I save some money. So let's say public opinion says that I'm Donald Trump and African Americans don't like me. But white people do. So what do I do? I change my campaign and I campaign for who? I campaign for African Americans and grab some of those votes. So public opinion helps a candidate, it helps them he refocus his campaign. It helps him save time and it helps him save money. Any questions about that? All right, so this is a question that's probably gonna be in your multiple choice exam. Make sure you remember this one. Actually, it's definitely gonna be in your exam. Who reports public opinion data for the people and politicians? Who usually lets us know about public opinion, what people think about candidates, what people think about issues, who usually gathers that data, and who usually reports that data. Interest, Interest groups have some of that data, but who usually reports data about what people think? Most of you have seen public opinion before, right? Where have you seen it? Here, the news. Media. The media usually is the one that gathers public opinion data and reports it to people. Um, in 2020, you guys are going to be bombarded with public opinion data um, as the election grows nearer and nearer. But the, uh, the media is usually responsible for doing that. So the question today is, how do we measure it? How do we measure public opinion? How do we know what people think? How do we know what people think about a particular issue or a particular candidate? Uh, the number one way people use is opinion polls or mass surveys. Opinion polls or mass surveys. What opinion polls do is they ask a randomly selected group of people, and that group represents an entire population. So something that you need to know, how many of you here are in stats? So a lot of this is going to sound familiar. Hopefully it's going to sound familiar to some of you. When we're doing polls, we're measuring the opinion of a population. So let's say I want to know what um, Hispanic women feel about abortion. What's in my immediate problem? I want to know what Hispanic women feel about abortion. What's my immediate problem? Race. That's not a problem because you're trying to target that population. Who's the population I'm trying to measure? Hispanic women. So what's my problem? Sorry? Region. There's a lot of you. There's millions and millions of Hispanic women in the United States. Why can't, what can I do? I can't possibly knock on everybody's door and make sure that you're a Hispanic woman and then ask you the abortion question. That's going to take too much time, it's going to take too much money, and it's practically impossible. So what do pollsters do instead? Instead of asking all Hispanic women, what do they do? They ask a handful of them that question, and the results represents an entire population. And believe it or not, if you do it correctly, if you follow co the steps correctly, you're able to produce very accurate results compared to the entire population. So, well, we have these two concepts that you need to know today, a universe and a sample. A universe is a population whose opinion you are trying to measure. A universe is a population whose opinion you are trying to measure. In my example, who is our universe? Hispanic, Hispanic women. That's the population whose opinion I'm trying to measure, so they are my universe. My problem is I cannot possibly ask them all, so what do I do instead? I ask only a couple of them, a portion of them. We call that a what? A sample. We, take, we call that a sample. A sample are the, the portion of the population actually asked. The portion of the population that is actually asked. So a universe is a population whose opinion we're trying to measure. A sample. Um, would be the portion of the population, the portion of the universe that we are actually asking the question. So this is how they usually do polls. They don't ask everybody, they only ask a portion of the population. Anyone have any questions on that? 
So let's talk about different types of polls. One of the uh, polls that you need to remember is a benchmark poll. It's exactly like it says. This is a favorite multiple choice questions on your AP exam. This will not, this will probably be on your multiple choice exam for this unit. A benchmark poll is a poll that is conducted in the beginning of a campaign. In the beginning of a campaign. It doesn't have to be an election campaign for a candidate. It could be a campaign for, to support a certain cause. So let's say if you're an environmentalist group and you want to bring awareness to people about, it, about, about climate change, before you start that campaign, before you start that movement, you do a benchmark poll. If you're Donald Trump, before you start your campaign, you do a benchmark poll. So what a benchmark poll does is it measures public opinion before a campaign starts. What's the point? It's not all on the right track. So before you start a campaign, either for a certain goal or to get elected, why would you do a poll? What's the point of a benchmark poll? There you go. What you do is you establish a baseline, and then you're going to conduct a future poll. And what do you do? You take that poll and you compare it to what you started out with. And what does that measure? What do you get? How it's changed. It measures how effective your campaign is. If public opinion is going positive, if public opinion increases, that means that your campaign was effective. If public opinion stays the same, that means your campaign wasn't that effective. If public opinion goes down, that means your campaign actually had a negative effect. So what a benchmark poll does is establishes a baseline for future um, polls to compare to. You have something to compare to so that you can evaluate how effective your poll is. So it's conducted in the beginning of a campaign. And the purpose is so you have a baseline to compare future polls to. So you can determine how effective your campaign is. If public opinion goes up, your campaign was effective. If it stays the same, it didn't really matter. It wasn't that effective. If it goes down, then your campaign had a negative impact. Another type of poll is a tracking poll. A tracking poll are a series of polls done over time. They are done over time. A tracking poll is a series of polls done over time. Why would you want to do a tracking poll? What does it tell us? How public opinion what? It changes. So it follows changes. A tracking poll follows changes in public opinion, which is very vital. It shows you how public opinion goes up and goes down. There's tracking polls about Donald Trump's, for example, approval ratings and how they go up and down over time. What tracking polls shows us is they reveal trends they reveal trends. I'm telling you right now, you're going to encounter a question about trend because part of your AP exam is to be able to evaluate graphs and charts. And they're going to ask you, point out a trend. Look at the chart, look at the graph, and point out a trend. What is a trend? A trend is not a point in the graph. A trend is a direction. A trend shows changes. So. How do you answer a question like where it says point out a trend? There's only three answers when somebody tells you what's the trend. There's only three answers. It's either going what? It's going up, it's going down, or it's staying the same. A tracking poll can help you point out trends. It can help you see how public opinion changes over time. Those trends can be going upwards or downwards or staying consistent. Make sure you remember that. So a trend is whether something is going up, down, or staying the same. So can you tell me about this public opinion poll right here, tracking poll right here? Is it going up, down, or staying the same over time? So it's about the same over time. So that's a trend. All right, um, what do you call this first poll in a tracking poll? That's a benchmark. Anyone have any confusion about tracking and benchmark polls? Benchmark poll is done when? 
Before a campaign, a tracking poll is done how? Over time, so it shows you changes. What was your question? Like the benchmarks, like the benchmarks you do in the beginning, but like you still change it to the Would it still be called a benchmark? No. So that initial, this is a tracking poll. All of this is a tracking poll. The beginning poll would be a benchmark. That makes sense. All of it is a tracking poll. But what about the last one? Yeah. Because our group of two main ones that it's really different. I'm sorry. Like the first and the last one. Do you think that's a benchmark poll? The very last one. It's not. Because a benchmark poll establishes a baseline. It establishes an initial reading of people's opinion. That last poll, I don't know what they call it, but it tells you the last thing that happened. Right. All right. Entrance and exit polls. Another favorite question on the AP exam. Entrance and exit polls are done during election time. And they are just like what they imply. They're done where? They're done outside of voting booths, outside of the voting polls, of polling stations. Uh, when is an entrance poll done? Before someone does what? Before someone votes, when did, when is an exit poll done? After someone votes. They only ask one question. What question is that? Who do you vote for? Who are you going to vote for? If it's an entrance poll, and if it's an exit poll, what? Who did you vote for? Does that make sense? So they're basically getting the votes from them. Sorry? They're basically getting the votes from them. Kind of. They're getting an idea of who's winning and who's losing. So an entrance poll is done just before a voter votes. They ask you, who are you going to vote for? An exit poll is done after a voter votes. And they ask you, who did you vote for? The purpose of entrance and exit polls is to predict the outcome of an election. To predict the outcome of an election. In 2020, you're going to see, during the presidential elections, um, even before the election is over, CNN is going to announce, Donald Trump wins Texas. It's not because we've counted the votes already. Those results are based on entrance and exit polls. Because, believe it or not, they're done correctly, they're very accurate. You can predict who's going to win a state based on those entrance and exit polls. So, on TV, when they announce somebody has won the state, it's not because we've already counted the votes, we haven't counted the votes yet, it's because of the result of these entrance and exit polls. If you do it correctly, you can predict the outcome of an election. Anyone have any questions? Is it like that <coughs> on the news when they show that like, huge map of the United States and like half of them are like uh -huh. red or whatever, that's what that is? Yes. Um, and CNN's going to be like, oh, we're going to declare that Texas is won by Donald Trump or by the Democratic candidate. Mm -hmm. That's based on the entrance and exit polls. Do you have to tell them? Sorry? You don't have to. You can even lie. But there's no point. <laughs> that's what I do. In lying. All right. Another way to measure public opinion is not using a poll, but instead having what we call a focus group. A focus group. A focus group is consisted of 10 to 20 people, and you're discussing a candidate, you're discussing a topic, you're discussing a political issue. Unlike polls, it doesn't give you an idea of what the population believes in. It's more in depth a focus group, because you can talk about more things than what a poll um, implies, what a poll reveals. Because a poll only asks a question. There's no intricacies, there's no nuance, but if you have a discussion, like in a focus group, um, there's more room for nuance, there's more room for discussion. So a focus group is a small representative sample of people or voters who brought together to discuss an issue or a candidate we don't do this only on politics. We also do this for um, new products, for example. If a new cereal comes out, you want to test it out in a focus group. If a new movie comes out, you want to test it out in a focus group and then try to feel what people feel about your movie before you actually release it to the public. So in every single facet of life, we usually use focus groups um, before something is released. In the United States, focus groups are used a lot in politics. So I'll show you one focus group. This was conducted by CNN. Look at the title. 
Um, this is about how Donald Trump is very different from a lot of presidents in that he doesn't really have a filter when he speaks. He's not very presidential when he speaks. Uh, he's often crass and sometimes insulting to some people or offensive to some people. Um, who's going to be part of this focus group? Look at the title. Trump voters. So these focus, this focus group is consisting of Trump voters. Hey, show hands. How many people are comfortable with the president's job? So you don't find some of it coarse or insulting or any of the other things he's accused of? I know sometimes you kind of cringe when he says, you know, hmm. get those SOBs off the field. That's not anything we don't hear all the time from our neighbors. And the fact that he speaks like everyday people, too, uh, has some weight. He's not perfect, far from perfect, you know, perfect. So I don't expect, I'm not, you know, I don't think everything he says is going to come off totally perfect. Um, but I think he's saying what a lot of us are thinking. How many of you think that the president's tone has affected the national tone? It's not only that, it's other things that he said and the way he says it, it's, it's very offensive. Such a? When you discuss about the Mexican community, how you refer to them and put them That's right, That's and right. right. That's an issue. You cannot just do things like that. And so why do you overlook that to give it to vote for him to give him then a B now you're in? I get, I'm going to be because I'm hoping that he learns a little bit more. And he changes his tone. Changes his tone a little bit. Give a little more respect to people. That's yeah. all I want. I just want to hear more response. He is respectful. You have to understand. Not respectful to me. And my community. And that's okay. Sure. I think he, he's doing his best under the circumstances, and and um, I just think people should just cut him a little bit slack. I do have something to say about the tone. I'm not comfortable with it. I think he should be setting the tone. Um, so a focus group gives you something that a poll cannot, like the whys. A poll can only measure how many people agree with his tone or how many people don't like his tone. Um, but um, in a discussion, you get to say why, and that's what a focus group gives us that uh, poll does not give. So this helps indicate what someone really feels about a certain topic, what a population really feels about something. Because there's more room for discussion, it's not a straight blank question, like a poll is. So that's another way to measure public opinion. All right, so in this class, we're gonna talk about scientific polls. You need to remember this, not all polls are the same. When you go online and you look at online polls, those are not scientific polls and they're often not reliable. Sometimes they're gonna coincidentally stumble across accurate results, but that doesn't mean they were done accurately, they were done scientifically. Not all polls are the same. So in this class, you're going to know what differentiates a good poll from a bad poll. And that's what you should remember, that's what you should take out of this class before you leave today what makes a poll a good poll, what makes a poll scientific, and what makes a poll trustable and reliable. All right, before we talk about um, what makes a poll accurate and scientific, you need to know what sampling error or margin of error is. Those of you that have stats, this should be very familiar to you. In every poll, there is something called a standard error or sampling error or margin of error. It's usually written in a percentage. What it tells you is how accurate the poll is to the actual population how accurate that poll is to the actual number, to the real number. So for example, let's say we have a poll in 2016 that in the state of Texas, 52% of Texans voted for Hillary Clinton and 48% voted for Donald Trump. Is that the real number? How do you know? Because we did not ask every Texan. What did they do instead? They asked a what? They asked a sample. We didn't ask all Texans. That's the universe. We didn't ask all Texans. We only asked a sample. So that's not going to be, it could be the real number, but it doesn't have to be the real number. In every poll, there is a standard of error or margin of error or sampling error. It's usually written in a percentage. In this poll, the standard error or the sampling error is 5%. What does that mean? What you do then is you take the percentage of your results you add 5 to it and you subtract 5 to it and that gives you a range and within that range is the real number of Texans that actually voted for Donald Trump that actually voted for Hillary Clinton so what it means is in Texas what is the range of what's the range of the actual number of people that voted for Hillary Clinton subtract 5 47, 47. add 5 57, 57. So the actual number of Texans that actually voted for Hillary Clinton 
falls within this range. Could it be 52? It could be 52, but does it have to be 52? No, it could be 48, it could be 55, it falls within that range. Does that make sense? Do, the, uh, do it for Donald Trump. What's the range for Donald Trump if the standard bearer is 5%? 43%, 43 to 53%. That's the actual number of people that voted for Donald Trump, or it's within that range. Anybody have any questions? What do you want your sampling error to be? Do you want it to be as big as possible or as small as possible? You want it to be as small as possible. The smaller the standard error, the more accurate um, to the real life results your poll will have. So you want your standard error to be 1% or 2%. Um, you don't want it to be 10% or 20% because the larger that number is, the less useful your poll will be. Let's pretend that the standard error is 1%. Do it for Hillary Clinton. It's within what? 51 to 53. Do it for Donald Trump? 47 to 49. So this is a more useful poll then because you narrow down your numbers, your range to a more manageable, more narrow range. Let's pretend your standard of error is huge. Let's say it's 40%. Do it for Hillary Clinton. 12, 12 92. to 92. What can you tell me about that poll? That poll is useless because it doesn't tell you anything. It could be 13 or it could be 90. It would be like telling you if you asked me what your grade is in my class, it's always a 70 plus or minus 30. <laughs> I didn't tell you anything because you could be failing or you could be passing. Does that make sense? You want your sampling error to be as small as possible so that you can the, you, the poll will be more useful. All right. <coughs> so now we get to the crux of what we're going to talk about today is what makes a poll a good poll. Number one, the people that you choose to ask a question to, your sample, they have to be representative of the population. They have to be representative of your universe. So for example, if I want to know what African Americans feel about prisons, who's my universe? Who's po which, population, who, which population whose opinion am I trying to measure? African Americans. So that's my universe. I can't possibly ask them all, so I have to ask a what? I have to ask a sample. If I choose to ask Annabelle, for example, what's wrong with that? She's not representative of the population. I could ask Darren, and she would be representative of the population, so he would be fair game. Does that make sense? Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. I need Yoselin Hernandez. Yoselin Hernandez, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. What if I want to know what people from the Rio Grande Valley feel about abortion? Who's my universe? All of Rio Grande Valley. What if I choose 10 people and Two of them are Hispanics and eight of them are whites. What's wrong with that? It's not diverse. It's not equal. It does not represent the universe. It does not represent the population. Why not? Because the majority is Hispanic. Because the majority of the people living in the Rio Grande Valley are Hispanic. So the majority of my sample should be what? Should also be Hispanic. Does that make sense? My sample has to be representative of the population I'm trying to measure. All right, next, and this is the most important one, number two. If you don't have this in your poll, you got nothing. When you're choosing who to choose, who to be part of your sample, you need to choose them in a random manner, random sampling. When you're choosing your sample, you need to pick them randomly. You are not allowed to pick and choose who you're going to ask because you're not going to yield very good results. What you have to do in stats, is in polling, is you need to choose their sample in a random manner. So let's say I want to know what this class feels about my outfit. How many of you like it? Uh, who's my universe? All of you would be my universe. I'm too lazy to ask all of you, so I'm going to take a sample of five kids. Right? If I chose only people with hair that goes down to their shoulders, would that be, would that be random? It would not be. Because 
Jose over here and Giselle are, don't have the same chances of getting chosen as one of my staff. He didn't have a chance, and she had a lot of chances. Everybody should have an equal chance of getting chosen. So give me a methodology. Give me a method in which I can select those five people in a random manner. The top five. That would not be random because that would be usually my five best kids, which they might have a different idea about fashion. So maybe those guys would be nerds and they may not have a good idea about fashion, for example. I can put all of your names in a hat and draw five people. That would be a random one. Oh, ID number, stuff like that. I can do that also. Anyone have any questions about random sampling? <laughs> I know. All right. <laughs> Poll, uh, most polls, they're done through something called random digit dialing. Those of you that have a TI-84, you can do this yourself also. They have a computer that produces a random number. What do they do with that number? Uh, to give you a clue, it's a seven digit number. Will they give you a number? They call it the phone number, they call it. <laughs> so they have a computer that produces a random number and then they call that number. That's how they make their samples random. Oh, oh are those so the random calls we get? Exactly. <laughs> All right. The next key to an accurate and scientific poll is a large sample size. The more people you ask, the better your poll will be. What happens to your standard error, your sampling error? Does it go up or down? The more people you ask, the bigger your sample size. Does it go up or down? Yeah. It goes down because you're getting closer and closer to the actual number. So the more sample size, the bigger the sample size, the smaller the sampling error will be. The more accurate your results will be. So if I want to know how many Rose students hate Ms. Kaufman, for example, I can do two polls. There's 4,000 of you in the, in the school. I can take a poll that asks 50 students, or I can take a poll that asks 500 students. Which one are you going to trust? The one that asks 500 students. It's going to be closer to the truth. That sampling error will be narrower. Any questions about this? The larger the sample size, the better. Next, unbiased questions. You have to be very careful how you ask your questions. You have to be very careful how you conduct the poll and how you ask the poll. Because some questions can lead the responder to respond one way or another. So what do I mean by that? I can ask the abortion question in two ways. I can say, do you believe in a woman's right to choose to terminate her own pregnancy? Or I can ask you, do you believe that women should be able to kill their own babies? Which one of those will not yield accurate results? The first one or the second one? The second one. Second one. Why? Because, because you're leading people to say what? That is a bad. Yes or no? no? You're leading people to say no. You're leading them to an answer, which is not going to be a good poll. You're skewing the results. So when it comes to polls, you need to ask mutual, unbiased questions. Questions should not lead the responder one way or another. It needs to be a neutral question. It cannot lead someone to a particular answer, or else your results are going to get screwed up. Any questions about that? All right, moving on. The last thing that makes a poll accurate and scientific is peer review. This is not, those of you that are going to go to the medical field and scientific field, this applies all the same. The lifeblood of science, which is what polling is, the lifeblood of studies, is peer review or transparency. When you're conducting your poll, it's not just that you make your results available to everybody, it's also that you make how you did your poll available to everyone. You need to be transparent in how you conducted your poll. You need to be open in how you conducted your poll. Why? Why do you need to publish how a poll was conducted? What does peer review mean? So other pollsters can take a look at your results and they can do what? They can view it. They can determine it. What can they do if you publish how you did the poll? What can they do? You can replicate it. You can do it again. 
And if it produces the same results, what does that do for your credibility? It confirms your results. It confirms your credibility. If you're a scientist and you make an experiment and you have results, but then you kept how you did it to yourself, who's going to trust you? No one's going to trust you. But if you produce how you did the experiment and other people copied it and they had the same results, it's replicable, then your findings are confirmed. It's the same thing with polls. You need to publish how you did your poll. So how the sample was taken, your margin of error, all that needs to be published openly. Why? Because peer review can point out the flaws in a, in a poll, in a study. Peer review can confirm if it's replicable, then they can confirm those results. They can confirm those results. So you want other people to take a look at your study, do your study themselves, so that they can confirm your results. All right, so remember this for your quiz, guys. What makes a poll scientific and accurate? How do you take your sample? Number one, the best, the number one thing, you need to make sure that your sample is taken in one way. You need to make sure that your sample, when you're choosing people, it needs to be representative, but the most important one though. It needs to be random. It needs to be a random sampling. You need to choose them in a random manner. How much of a sample do you want to have? The larger, the better. What kind of questions do you need to ask? Unbiased question. What do you do with your findings? You make you publish it. You you make it um, transparent so that other people can replicate it. Make sure you remember all the tenets, all the characteristics of a good poll, because this is a favorite question on your AP exam. All right. So why do we care about polls? What's the impact of polls today? Polls are often used by policymakers as a guide when they're making decisions. If I was a senator or a House of Representative member, it might be a good idea to take a look at a poll whenever I'm voting on bills. Why is that? Because I want to get what someday? Why is it that when we're deciding whether or not to say yes or no to a bill, why should I look at a poll and look at what my constituents think about something? Because I want to get reelected. If I want to get reelected and I don't follow my constituents, then I'm risking them punishing me for it. So polls, politicians may want to pay attention to polls, especially if they want to get reelected. More often than not, you want to follow your constituents. You want to do what they want you to do. Here's a question. If I was Senator Ted Cruz, and I'm voting on an abortion bill, for example. I take a look at a poll about my constituents, about Texas, about abortion. And then based on what my, the majority of my constituents want, that's how I vote. How, what am I practicing? What model of representation am I practicing? I look at a poll. I see that the majority of my constituents want me to do this, want me to vote yes, for example. So I vote yes. What model of representation am I practicing? Uh, I'm either a trustee or a delegate. What am I? I am a delegate. What is a delegate? You're a what? You're a puppet. You're a follower of your constituents. You do what your constituents want you to do. What's a trustee? You make your own decisions, even if sometimes that goes against your what? Your constituents. Make sure you remember that. What do we call it? Somebody who's a little bit of both. Political. Political. Make sure you remember that. All right. There's a negative to this. Sometimes politicians, they just follow the polls, and they do what their constituents want, even though it's a bad idea. In the United States, we have problems right now, and you're going to see this as you grow up. We have problems right now that require very unpopular decisions, very unpopular solutions. And if you vote for these solutions, you're going to risk not getting reelected. A lot of politicians in the U.S. government right now, they don't want to take that risk. So they take the safe route. Instead of doing what's right, instead of making the tough choices, instead of making those unpopular choices, they look at the polls and they're scared that they're not going to get reelected. 
So what our politicians become, they become followers instead of leaders. Leaders are supposed to be the one making tough choices, even if those choices are unpopular, even if those choices are the minority in the polls. But right now, it's becoming harder for politicians to do so because they're always looking over their shoulders. All right. This is another important thing today. Public policy often does not align with um, public opinion. What we want, what this country wants, does not always translate into public policy. Like for example, when it comes to gun control, the majority of Americans want stricter gun control. They want more gun laws to be implemented in the United States. The majority of us here in this country want better gun laws. How much gun laws have we passed? In the US government, how much gun laws have we passed recently? Not a lot. Actually, I think it's zero. Sandy Hook came, Orlando shooting came, a lot of other shootings that happened, the US government has done nothing about it. So sometimes, what the people want, public opinion, does not become public policy. And you need to know why. There are three reasons why public opinion is not translated into public policy um, in the United States. Number one, sometimes politicians, they don't, they don't like the results of a poll. They question the methods in which that poll is conducted. If there is question about whether or not the poll is accurate or scientific, then a politician may ignore the results of a poll. Whenever our president sees a poll that disagrees with him, what does he say? That's what? Fake news. That's fake news. So he dismisses that. So sometimes he ignores public opinion because he doesn't trust the polls. Another thing, sometimes there's questions about the timing of a poll. So there's politicians right now who's always voting against gun control. And the reason why they're voting against gun control is they say those polls are done right after a what? Right after a shooting where people are more emotional. So I'm not going to trust the results of that poll because people were emotional when those polls were conducted. So they often ignore those results and vote for something else. All right, next. Maybe the issue that the poll is talking about doesn't really matter to someone's constituents. So let's say I'm Ted Cruz and I'm voting on gun control, for example. And according to the poll, most Texans want gun control. However, gun control is low in our priorities. What does that mean for me? If I was a representative, do I have to follow my constituents? Why not? Because it doesn't matter for them. If they're passionate about an issue, if I don't follow them, what are they going to do? They're not going to reelect me. They're probably going to punish me. But if they're not passionate about an issue, and it's not important to them, then I can go ahead and exercise discretion. What kind of representation is that? I told you before, if your constituents don't really care about an issue, you have more room to be a what? Trustee. To be a trustee, to make your own decisions. And sometimes that's what politicians feel like. I'm going to ignore that poll because the issue being talked about by that poll, my constituents don't really care about. So they're not going to punish me for going against them. Next. Sometimes the result of the poll is legit. Like, for example, this is a poll about debt-free tuition in the United States. Um, government helping you with your student debt. This is for all voters. 70% of us support debt-free tuition in the United States. Only 25% are opposed to debt-free tuition. Do we have debt-free tuition in the United States? No. We do not. Public opinion does not equal public policy. Why not? Because the majority of the people on this issue, who would be in favor of debt-free tuition? Younger people, you guys, my generation, your generation, you would be in favor of, um, of debt-free tuition. Who would be in the minority of this issue? Older people. 
your grandparents who think that you should not depend on government too much are going to be the minority in this issue. What's the difference between us and them? They vote. Your politicians are scared of them. So when it comes to if I was a politician, who should I be scared of? The minority in this issue, the majority in this issue? Minority. The minority in this issue because they're more politically active. Because they vote more, I'm going to ignore what the majority of Americans want and I'm going to follow the minority because they're the ones that matter to me because they're the ones that actually vote. Does that make sense? So you have three reasons why public opinion does not always equal public policy. First one is, if they can question the reliability of a poll, then they can ignore it. Second one is, how important that poll is to their what? To their constituents. If it's not important, then you ignore public opinion. Third one is, if the minority in the issue is more what? It's more politically active than the majority of that in that issue. Then um, you can ignore public opinion. All right, next. Impact of polls on elections. I need you to remember what the bandwagon effect is. This is something that happens to human beings because we are social creatures um, evolutionarily. We are programmed to want to belong to a pack. We want to belong to a group. Uh, we, we travel by herds, basically. And today, that behavior results in, when it comes to polls, and you see a certain issue is gaining popularity, or certain candidates gain popularity, what tends to happen? If something is popular, people tend to want to join that thing. That's why Kim Kardashian is a thing, right? If something is popular, people want to jump on its bandwagon. Those of you that like sports, they usually use this term in sports. Um, when a team um, suddenly is winning, suddenly they have more fans because people start jumping on their bandwagon. It's the same thing in politics. If an issue or a candidate gains popularity, people want to support what's popular. Any questions about the bandwagon effect? All right, next. Polls can actually affect election results. It can skew election results. Polls can skew election results, especially presidential election results. Here's why. Let's look at the board. We're a huge country, spanning thousands of miles, which means in this country, who votes first? We have different time zones. Who votes first? The East Coast votes first. Who votes last? The West Coast votes last. Before these guys vote, these guys will vote, which means what kind of polls are being taken already? What kind of polls are being taken? Uh, entrance. The entrance polls and those exit polls that predict the outcome of election, and that's getting reported in CNN and Fox News. And Californians and people from the West Coast are seeing those polls, and it can affect whether or not they vote or not vote. If you saw that 80% are voting for Donald Trump, if you're a Trump supporter in California, what do you do? Or oh, he's winning by a lot, so I, need to vote. I don't need to vote. If you're a Hillary Clinton supporter and you see 80% of people in the East Coast voting for Donald Trump, you're going to be like, oh, it's hopeless. I don't need to vote. So these polls can skew the result. It can encourage people to vote or it can discourage people to vote. Because we live in different time zones, those polls are published. And people see those polls. All right, what we do tomorrow, you need your actual notes. Guys, you don't have homework, but you have a quiz over uh, lessons one and two tomorrow. Quiz over lessons one and two.
Thank <laughs> you. 